Look at that. Isn't that the most beautiful thing you've ever seen in your life? Look at that. A dead gum brand new chainsaw right out of the box. But uh, the sucker was only like $200. And it's got a 10 inch bar. So I thought that, you know, because once you start going up beyond that, you want to get a 12 inch and whoo, now it's 400 or something, you know. <clears throat> but I don't need much length here. But here's the deal. Look at this. There's no gasoline. Just You just plug it in. And charge it up. And then you go. It is so convenient and so awesome. It looks like a big old gas tank and everything here, but it's not. It's just a little motor. And uh, this was uh, 40 volt. And I figured that should be good because they sold them 18 volts and 20 volts. So this was double. And the one that was 20 volts was like only $139. This was $200. So I figured it was worth that extra $60, $70 to have it double the power in case you're trying to get through a log. But I'm, I'm just about ecstatic with, I want to save this and put it on every time I put it. I'm going to try to be good. Try to be, be nice and... Yeah, it's Black & Decker, which sounds like a good name to me. I don't know. You know? Lithium. Woo-wee! Huh. It's just a really nice one, huh? So we don't know what you're saying, but that sure does look shiny up there. What is it? A little one. Huh? What we got going here? Chickens? Boy, them, them roosters are beautiful. I mean, you, you know, you don't think of it as like, oh, it's just a chicken. It's just a chicken. I've seen roosters. They're pretty. But it's not a pheasant. I don't think you can find a pheasant that would be any prettier than that, that rooster right there. <laughs> Except I can't keep the camera on it. I mean, let me see if I can get closer. There's, I mean, beautiful white streaks through it. And, you know, I'm sure he's getting prettier every day, too, because he's not that old. There's three of them that look like that. That's beautiful. You see the tail, there's green. Where'd he go? Where'd he go? Here he is. Look at this tail. It's green. There's green under there. It's the prettiest darn thing I ever did see. Well, let's get some firewood. Oh, what a beautiful day. Now that I got this chainsaw, I'm gonna cut this tree back. I don't even wanna cut that. I think it's beautiful, but I'm gonna cut this little one up. But I'll be able to cut this back a little bit and make the road a little wider. Now this tree here is dead too. You know, I could cut that, use it for firewood, but you know, I. I don't know if I want to. Then it'd be like a hole there. Like, I, I like the trees. So, I'm going to come in here and cut the branches back underneath. So, they got a little bit of... They can grow. I don't even know if I want to always cut the branches on the bottom either. Some of them I like. The low-lying branches. <clears throat> yeah. Well, it dries out in the winter. All the dra grass dry <laughs> dries up. And I think partly due to the lack of rain, we haven't had much rain. It rained a lot this summer, but not 
probably in the last month or two, I don't know. But a little sprinkle here and there, but the temperature's mild and it's beautiful weather. It's just it doesn't pour down a lot. You know. I love the weather here. I mean, just when you need it to rain is the summertime. I just love the weather. I'm, I'm kind of like in, in that pinch me mode, really, most of the time here since I've been here. And I'm not saying this is the prettiest place in the world. I'm saying it certainly has merits that one could claim for it, but you know, I certainly, I've been a lot of places in the United States. I've been to Canada all the way up quite a ways north into Canada. But I never went into Mexico and I haven't gone overseas and I've never been in an airplane and I never will. It's just one of those things I don't want to do. I mean, I ain't scared or nothing. I just don't want to. <laughs> it's probably one of those I'd be one of those guys at 19, 1902 and they're like, eh, these model T's are coming out. You want to ride in these things called cars? Nah, no thanks. No thanks. I'll stick to the horse and buggy. Now, I'd, I'd stick to the horse now. I love my truck, my my Sierra. Oh man, that's my that's what that's that is my horse. You might say, my best friend, old sweet Betsy from Pike. I, I love her, but you know, I would have probably had a, a an even stronger relationship with my mule team and horses. But you know that I gave up that before I was born, so. Here we are. <clears throat> and I don't mind cars. Like I said, I love cars. I, it, it, airplanes? I don't know. I don't mind flying. I think one day we'll have a way to fly. Just, I, I know that. I, in my uh, out of body journeys, <clears throat> I have seen places where people just fly. There are certain higher realms where individuals can fly and you know it won't be for a while with humans but it's kind of an ability just like you you know how you've got electric eels that can generate like 800 volts they can kill you and they're like what i wonder if anybody studied this how does this happen how do they generate 800 volts from this little fish well, there's a lot of mysteries in the world. They probably probably know how that eagle does it, and they don't want us to know, but, you know, self-contained, right? What do you say, a pump? The, the, the fish's gill makes it happen? Like our heart pumps? You know, how, what, does it make, what makes our heart pump? I'm sure there's quite a few volts going through that thing. Every few seconds as well. But, yeah, I've been there and I've, I've been to other planets. They do exist, but I'm told they are just us, this place, this earth, duplicated to infinity in other infinite realms. Each and every one of them is just the divine being in all of the, in all of its variable parts, the parts of the whole. And every cell is just another replica of the entire whole. And there's no where or place. There's only the infinite. But when we perceive one thing like a flower, that is the divine being in its capacity of being smaller. 
It has the ability to do all things. It's in you all, through you all, and above you all. So it's operating in, in the infinite world. It is the infinite is operating all at once, but it's perceived in the finite as time and space. So you or me in another time and place. And I am you in another time and place. And we're all the Almighty. In all of this glorious. Oh, I've gotten a revelation this week about glory and what glory is. You know, I saw the glory of Jesus Christ. I told you all the story. I, I never have talked too much about it because it's kind of a personal story. It's my personal prayer that I made with the Lord to, to understand and, to, and for Him to come and show me what was the right path. And I asked if He would just give me the truth. I could share it with everyone. If I could just know what to say. Because I know He wants all of us to attain into eternal life. And I saw these little orbs of light. I've, I've mentioned this many times. Some of you will laugh, and that's okay. I'm going to tell the story. This is what happened. There were millions, I don't know, millions. I didn't count them. There were a lot of these orbs coming flying down, like a, a whole legion of angels or something. I don't know. They, I, I didn't know what they were at first. I was kind of scared. Because I'd never seen anything like it. There's thousands of little orbs. They were coming from the sky at a downward angle toward me. At first I thought, what in the world is that? You know, I never seen nothing like that, but I wasn't too worried about it because never thought they would come all the way down to where I could touch one. And they were all coming and flying around. Look at these berries. They're ripe right now. I was eating some of them the other day. They are so delicious, these juniper berries. Sweet with a slight taste of turpentine. <laughs> but, you know, they're edible and they're quite delicious, actually, when you get used to them. Mm. They're, they were ripe last week. Right now they're starting to go to seed just slightly. There's a narrow window on these things, but they're, they make gin out of these. Mm. I love them. It's sugar. <laughs> it's like the sugar pine. My grandpa cut down the biggest sugar pine in California with a handsaw. <laughs> yeah, back and forth saw. My grandpa. My dad was a logger too, but like father, like son. I don't know because I never wanted to be a logger. No, thank you, man. They work hard. <laughs> I couldn't do it. I suppose if that was my, I'm probably going to have this other drive to, to understand my biggest desire what to learn and understand and so I spent most of my time just searching and looking at the stars they called me a dreamer a lazy guy I was kind of lazy but I wasn't lazy I was working hard very hard trying to understand I fasted and prayed and didn't care about material things you know I'd work probably about nine months flipping burgers make a few dollars and I'd go out in the woods camp for a while and pray but in that field I was about 22 this fellowship when I was 18 so I spent about four years searching praying and that's when I met my teacher, Rusty, and he had uh, been a student of Don Juan. You know, he read the book of Carlos Castanadas. He was the last of the, um, you know, the line of the Quetzalcoatl in the high priesthood. 
and I do believe that he handed that information on to my teacher, Rusty. And Rusty took me to a forest, a beautiful place out in the middle of absolute nowhere and had me kneel down and he laid on his hands upon me and prayed for me to receive the divine Holy Spirit. From that point forward, I began to see things quite differently. And he told me about his... Um, abilities. Of course, you know, I went out and got the book. That's what Don Juan did. He would leave his body and that's what the native priests, the, the shamans did. And they would make their own world. They would become their own lord. Their own ruler. Their own deity. Christians would think that was blasphemy, but that's the true priesthood from Jesus Christ. Because Enochic land is the land of Enoch. And that was the city that Jesus built, the city of Enoch. You know, the Aztecs took them over and the other groups, but all that stuff you hear, you know, the bloodthirsty... Uh, Human sacrifices and stuff that wasn't done by Jesus. So that was after Satan went in and infiltrated, like he does everywhere. The giants that the Navajo speak of that weren't like them. They were very tall. The giants. They came in and massacred them and you know and all kinds of terrible things. But he taught me to leave my body and to uh, ascend into the higher realms and to meet with the elders. You know, one day I'll teach more on all of that. There's a lot to be understood, but I continued to be uncertain about things and was searching. And when I was about 22, I'm standing in the field and I said to the Lord, I said, I'm not leaving until I understand. I want to be able to take this truth to the world and I want to know the exact answers you know how to achieve not just to be a, an apprentice and I stood there for hours but like I said I saw these orbs of light and then across this I was standing in a up in northern Idaho in Bonners Ferry anybody anybody's been up there with me get a better idea where I was but at the time beautiful tall pine trees and tamarack and firs and cedars and everything up there is beautiful big sort of ice uh, peaks you know glacier like peaks with little glacier lakes it was beautiful not quite as beautiful. We go further north up into Banff and Jasper, but it's like that, and it's quite beautiful. Something on your toes? But, um, so I'm in this, I live in these apartments in Bonner's Ferry, they call the Bonnesbury Apartments, I'm not sure. Can't remember now. But um I'm pretty sure that's what it was called. Uh, right next to John Deere. <laughs> it's his apartment complex. And be and behind John Deere and behind the apartments, there's um this big track, like a football field, behind the grammar school. It went up to sixth grade, and I actually went to that two months of that school, and then that was the last grade I attended in public school. But this was years later. I mean, that I was only uh, 13 or something then, but 
and that's where my dad ended up growing the beard and then we all got excommunicated for it and you know kangaroo court for a year straight and mom and dad ended up splitting up and went on the journey to hell for a while it was pretty bad there was a lot of problems that it was difficult to deal with I was basically on my own from the time I was 15 although I'd go spend time with mom but I was working and I was sort of my own man she gave me a, my first car and I worked from the time I was 15 but when I'm 22 this is after I went back to California and they drummed up some stuff on me and disfellowshipped me and I was no longer really thinking in terms of, you know, even even my conscious mind. Even on the surface, I didn't even pretend to think that Job's witnesses were true. So therefore, I was confused and I wanted to know what the truth was. What to tell the people. What to tell myself, my sister, my mother, my father. I was worried. My mom and dad, I felt like somebody needed to know the answers. And if I could figure out what the answers were, I could, we could all get saved. You know, I could, I, I was worried about my family. That's the whiner. Huh, Bubba? No, that's not Bubba. That's Noopy, too. Oh, Noopy? Who Noopy wants up there? You make it. Show him how. Show him how, Buffy. But. Anyway, I, I stood there in the field. And this across on the opposite end I was on the side by the fence to where the apartments were I was walking back to the apartments after I'd been in prayer and I'm at the fence and I'm looking back on the, to the, on the other side that goes into the, uh, the back end of the John Deere and there was a little where the fence ended and there was a little trail that went around it where people would walk it's like a little trail and people would cut it through the, the school track field and so it was you know was only a couple hundred two three hundred feet away from me when i saw this white glowing angelic being i didn't know who it was at first but i knew that i could not But, you know, admit it, it, it had to have been a divine thing here. This person was glowing and they were sort of hovering about six inches off the ground and just moving along toward me. And I've told this story before and I've always said, well, I couldn't see their face. But the, the deeper point about that is that you cannot see the Lord's face. And what does it really mean? Is it some literal thing? Couldn't the Lord show himself to you as a man without this blinding light? Well, maybe could, but then you wouldn't know if it was the Lord. And the point is, is when you come into contact with, with the Lord, Jesus Christ, you're going to gain something from it. When Moses saw Yahweh, uh, he saw the backside, the dark side. But when he saw it went up Mount El, Elyon, Mount Horeb, the Mount of the True Deity, he saw his glory. But he says, "You cannot see my face. You can't see the face of the divine being and live." So we've always thought it just means that you can't see his face. What does that mean? You can see his glory. What is that? <laughs> we kind of understood it in a sense. But, but we didn't go deep into what that really means. And what it means, if you were to take it and interpret it down to its deepest esoteric meaning, the face is the detail of the identity the whole story, everything about this person, his source. Now the face also represents the forward part. And forward means towards the sun. 
the light part or the revealed part. And that means the details. I couldn't see his eyes, his nose, his face. I didn't. I couldn't recognize his care, his all of his physical parts in the physical world. I couldn't see his face, but I saw his glory. In other words, it, 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 the glory isn't light. The glory is the understanding, the comprehension. The magnitude of this person includes more than the physical looks. So you're not seeing the face or the physical appearance, but you're seeing deeper things that cannot be seen with the physical eye, with the physical eyes. You're seeing him spiritually. If the physical body could see the character or, 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 or perceive his face, his, his, his light, his knowledge, his true appearance, the physical body would immediately die. And that's fine if you, you know, there is no death, he will just simply be translated. But if you're gonna be on the earth for a while longer, if it's not your time to go, you can't grasp the divine being in the flesh. Is anyone who has that knowledge and they're walking around in the flesh, They're going to be translated like Enoch was. That's why Enoch is perfect now and was capable of coming to the world and conquering Satan because he had already walked with El. That's the only person in the Bible that ever walked with El the Most High. Many others met Jesus. You see, because Moses saw El's glory, and El's glory is Jesus. That's his glory. But El's nothing, or the illusion, is Yahweh. So Moses saw both Sinai and Horeb. He saw both the front and the back. But the glory was veiled. You can't see that. And Moses himself shone like a bright light you couldn't look upon him. That's what the glory looks like in the physical world. A light that you can't look into. Meaning you can't comprehend. You cannot comprehend it. In this world. With these eyes. With this consciousness. So, when somebody sees the Lord, it'll say they saw a blinding light or something, like the Apostle Paul, which means that, and, and the people there couldn't see it, because they didn't have that understanding. They heard a voice. In other words, their revelation was lower, a, a different vibration, a sound voice, or a sound revelation. But Moses, or the Apostle Paul got a light revelation, a mental he knew. He understood. He went to paradise. At the end of the three years, 14 years ago plus three, he was initiated into the Essene on the road to Damascus. When he got there, he was initiated. And that blinding light was a part of that. It was the knowledge that he heard. Unspeakable words. It was unlawful to speak. That's the same as you can't see it with the physical eye. You can't, it can't be spoken. It can't be understood. Only can understand it by, by the blinding light, by the glory, and to see that glory. But you cannot see his face with your physical eyes or you will be translated into glory yourself. So people who see of the blinding light, what it's saying is they're seeing in the spiritual everything. They meet the Lord and its fullness. And they're commissioned to do things and they are uh, given instructions. Because that doesn't happen just for no reason. When somebody meets the Lord, you have a conversation and you become aware of your destiny and, and, and you fulfill that destiny. And, and the angels 
from that point forward are guiding you. But sometimes, well, all the time, as long as you're going to stay on the earth, like the apostles did, then they, they, they explain it as a blinding light. In other words, they couldn't see it all. They couldn't comprehend it all in this physical world. And the only thing that they can write down from that divine source is what the divine source wants the conscious mind to know. And that's, oh, there goes a rabbit. And so, someone who has been given the initiation of seeing the blinding light, seeing the Christ, they hear words that they can't communicate to others. They know it internally, and it comes out. The Holy Spirit brings to mind what he told us. And when we need to know it, we can go forth and preach, and the words that come out of our mouth come from the divine source. In other words, they come from this inner knowing that we were given. But we don't carry it around with us in our conscious mind because it's impossible. We can't see it with our physical eyes. In the physical, we're no different than anyone else. But there's this channel. At that point, it's a gift. It's, it starts to pour forth like gifts. So some have greater gifts. They've opened it further. Paul, the Apostle Paul says, I, I am grateful that I have more gifts than all of ye. What are those gifts? Well, you know, like visions, you know, dreams. Least you could have is dreams. Almost everybody has dreams. That's a gift. You're opening up that channel to the to the Lord. But then you're able to have these same dreams, but consciously, and that's a vision in waking state. And to prophesy comes after. Well, first to interpret, the interpretation is given and is greater than speaking in tongues because interpretation has to be with understanding to edify. So both of them are gifts, but some of them are just edifying you. But when you're able to interpret it to the world, that's prophecy. And prophecy is what is done to edify the congregation, the world, to teach. And that's what a teacher is, and that's what a seer is. And invariably, all of them, to become a teacher, they have to have been initiated and have seen paradise. So the Apostle Paul said he was taken to the third heaven, which is paradise. And so if you notice, all of the prophets have visions of paradise. And what that means is they have the, the knowledge of astrology, which is the symbols of each of these animals they can interpret, and they can in see a scene, even on the earth. It's all symbolic. Today I was at uh, Walmart, had run down to pick up the chainsaw. And I whooped in there, pulled one car length away from another black Sierra. Mine's a blue Sierra. It's about the same, a little newer than mine, but it was real nice, black Sierra. I didn't notice it at that point that it was a black Sierra. But I saw this black truck out of the corner of my eye. I pull up, stop, throw it into park, open the door, and just as I start to slide out, right next to me, as she crossed the, the one car length, there's this big black crow staring me right in the face. And he wouldn't move. He looked at me and went, ah! And I thought of, you know, the devil's black crow that put, that, Derek Rose is always putting all over everything. Makes me wonder what he does that for. And why he's got this little pedophilia butterfly with blue and pink on it. A symbol of the International Pedophilia Organization. And I won't say any more. I have other information. But that's not what I want to talk about today. But that, that was a message. It was a warning. It was a warning for me this morning. And many people would see that, like a Job's Witness, they don't look for omens. And they would just have ignored it. But I don't ignore those things. If it had been a beautiful white dove, 
it would have been something completely different. But anyway, these things are like synchronicities and they just happen in such ways that it's beautiful. And they continue to happen. You know, they're not... It's not something that just happens once and you wonder, what the, I wonder if that means something. And then you get more you know, confirmations of it as well. So the Lord is, you know, just watching out for us. It's the way the, the, the everything commu com uh, communicates is communion. And to take communion, you have to have a channel open. This is why they, they took partook of the bread and the wine laced with the honey from the daffodil, which was to open those channels of communion. You can do it with cannabis and other things. I do it on a... At least all the holy days and Sabbaths, we should be in communion. So... This uh, glowing white, shining, bright being hovering over the ground came toward me, and, you know, must have been a minute or something. As I'm staring at this being, I'm aware of the fact that I see him. I know everything, what he looks like. I know what color his hat or shoes are or whatever. He didn't have a hat, but, you know, I could see everything. And yet, with my conscious mind, I could not retain any understanding of what he looked like. I was perceiving it in the spirit. It was being registered. It was a symbol that I was... The experience that I was having was not being recorded to be replayed in this conscious mind. It's something I can experience through that channel. It's always with me. The Lord is always with me. The channel is open. I can communicate at any time. I've gone to this holy and sacred place. When the Lord got right up to me, where I could should have been able to distinguish his features, what he looked like, his hands, his feet. I could have told you if he had sandals or anything else. But in that very split second, I used to think maybe I turned away, but I, that's not what happened. I didn't turn away at all. I didn't blink. I just could not retain in my conscious mind the memory of what happened in those few seconds. When I was able to remember again, he was flying, that divine white glowing being was going up over the trees and up into the sky. And... I went home and wrote that novel that I have shared with you guys. Which was just a kind of a parabolic understanding of and synchronicity that was just placed into my mind from that day forward. I've always been able to access it. <clears throat> but
boy, they turned to kind of a pink here. A bright reddish. Let's see. Pink, red, orange, which is it? It's kind of pastel. So pretty. <sighs> but yeah, I've been all over this country and some in Canada and I've seen I don't think I've ever been anywhere that I don't long for this country here is not I wouldn't want to be here for all of eternity even though this is like the the place that the Lord has for me now and I feel like this is home and I'm completely satisfied and I'm, I'm just elated by the beauty Every time I take a walk and everything I see, it's just like it's perfection. I have no need to go anywhere else in the world. I'm happy and content. I have everything that, I mean, more than I deserve. I, everything. You know, it, it, I, the only, the only reason I sense that I have this beautiful place is because I'm, I'm not tensing I'm not having some of the issues that I did. It takes, you know, it, it, this thing about faith and, and perfecting it. They have all different ways and different schools, but the answer is it's all just methods in order to get you to open up your heart and relax and let it be. Oh, let it be. Let it be. Let it be. Let it be. And seek the words of wisdom. Let it be. And that song is beautiful. And it's, a, it's, it's written by angels. I mean, Mother Mary and everything in that, 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 you know, she speaks to me in my hours of loneliness. That's a beautiful song. But that just came to mind. But it's, a, it's an art and it's an it's experience. To develop faith and to to be at ease and to to have nerves of steel and not be afraid because you're someone who's had ex enough experience in life that you know it's all going to work out and as soon as you let go of the fear it does all work out everything is just a test and the test is one when you when you overcome the fear so you know, for years I've been hearing these truths, understanding them, praying, meditating on it. It doesn't necessarily follow, though, from that. That you're a master for in one second. You know, you're an apprentice until, until it's the appointed time. Your destiny is, is marked in the stars. There's nothing anyone can do to hasten it. But I had a dream last night. It was a nightmare. I haven't had nightmares for quite a while. Nightmares are a sign that you're going through some struggles. And I thought that I'd kind of conquered some of those. I'd had some not too long ago. And not recently. But recently I, I had taken you guys. I heard told you the story about the mushroom. And <laughs> it was quite an experience. And went to, to the presence of Mother Mary herself. And she healed me of many things. And I'm not going to talk about that today. So I'm, I've been doing really good. And I think things are really working out the way they are. Partly due to all of this. I just feel like I'm in a better place. And I'm not as anxious and insecure about things like humans do. Oh, this is neat. I love this. But, you know, lingering behind all of that, there's always something. There's always something holding you back to the next, that, you know, stopping you get to the next stage. And maybe we're not even aware of it. Sometimes we might be, we might know it's something, but we're not aware of what it is.
but I spent hours in this nightmare last night and it's like I said it's unusual but it was pretty fr frightening I was there and I had no home I had nowhere to go all my family had left me and I was trying to keep autumn safe and we were homeless and on the streets and we had moved into some building that like just to sleep we just we didn't own we didn't have any money we just kind of opened the door and went in and slept we had nowhere to sleep and uh, it was pretty scary not just because it was hardships But because I was scared out of my mind that I was going to lose my daughter, if somebody would take her from me in, the, in this nightmare, it was a battle to keep her safe. And uh, at one point, somebody found out that we were in there, and huh, my whole family came. And nobody stood up for us. And I was like all alone. It was really, really scary. My whole family just disowned me in this nightmare, which is kind of what happened. I mean, not, I don't think, uh, if any of my family sees this, understand, I, I know none of you did that but that's how it was my destiny played out that's how it felt it wasn't anybody's fault and nobody did that on purpose certainly not my mother and my sister she her and i was were close for the last year or so of her life and i believe that was by divine implementation because she died after that and that's another story for another time but my daughter, they did try to take my daughter when I was, when she was little. I, I may have told some stories on that because um, I was a single father and there's a lot of prejudice involved and there were times we didn't have anything. You know, uh, when my mother died, for instance, we were left standing in a six foot, I don't know, four foot, <laughs> quite a few feet of snow and we had nothing. We had no, I, because my job, I, I just, mom passed away, so I was kicked off the property out of the cabin that I was building onto. I had gotten some sliding glass doors and I had put a little kitchen on it and stuff. And I was working, but my car broke down the very same, that same week. It just blew up and it was just no good anymore and I had no way to get to work. I had to drive 30 miles to work. And I couldn't get to work, so I had no money. I had nowhere to go. And I'm standing in a snowbank with my daughter. This, this, this is kind of the, the, the theme of my life, you know. And I was kind of hiding because people would, you know. We ended up having to build a teepee in the woods. And I prayed about it. And the Lord, my, my boss, actually phoned me and said, hey, don't worry about it. Because her husband worked at the car dealer. She said, we'll, we'll give you a car. Please come back to work. So... I was able to survive, but it took us, we had to live in that teepee for two or three weeks. And the worst thing about all that was that, and the same throughout the whole, the one thing I had left was a box of tools and that, that I needed that were very important that, that, you know, was left to me. And the only thing I had left in my own name was up a couple of blankets and some clothes. And of course, my precious of all things is my daughter. But the other thing was I had this guitar, this Fender guitar that my mother had bought me when I was very young and I learned to play on it and somebody stole that that same week and it broke my heart. I hadn't really played the guitar since. I've tried playing a couple of tunes for you guys here recently, last couple, three years, but I hadn't really for many, many years, I, did, I hadn't even played the guitar. I just gave it up because my guitar was missing. And I like, ah, screw it. I, I didn't have time for that anyway. I was too busy 
trying to seek out all kinds of beautiful truths. Oh, I love this. This. So, I'm saying I love this country. This is like, I couldn't think of a prettier place. I'm at home. I'm at peace. I'm so happy here. But if I were anywhere else in the world, I think I would be just as happy. I mean, I've been everywhere. And I've, there's nowhere that I don't long for. That wherever I've been, and I've been there any time, length of time, I miss it. Like, I still miss in Alabama. And I never knew that. I was always told, oh, go back east and it's all icky and bad and you know and the bugs and, and there were no bugs there it was just the most delightful place there in the Appalachians and you know I didn't get to see all of Georgia and stuff I know it's pretty there up in the northern part of Georgia and towards the, the savannah and all that I, I didn't get to see it's, it's a paradise you know I have to wonder if Georgia's not prettier than up in Florida and stuff like that up in Tennessee up in that area all the way up to Virginia is beautiful and I long for I miss it but I've also spent time on the Arkansas Oklahoma border in the Ozark area that to me is is a place that I miss deeply and as well as the panhandle of Texas all the way up through uh, western Oklahoma and up through Kansas that that people think you think all oh, Kansas is not pretty right there's no mountains there's no there's no canyons there's no it's not you know it's cold like South Dakota, North Dakota, that's not pretty. Oh my goodness, some of the prettiest places I've ever been is in Kansas. That's where I went. I've done footage of it. Remember guys? And look at that little cave right there. Um, those mushroom park where all the rocks look like mushrooms. It was the most amazing, beautiful place. I was like, oh, this is heaven. And I wished for a place like that. And look what I got here. They're not mushroom shapes, but there's rocks everywhere. And the other thing, and I've all, and I, that was one of the things in my heart that I, I love the deepest is these beautiful rocks, the Sedona area. And this is another. I I call this the Sedona area because I'm not that far from there. You know, the whole Arizona, New Mexico border, and all this Sedona, Flagstaff, Red Mesa area where I'm at, the El Moro and El. You know, mile pace. What is this? What lives in there? Holy crap, I one of these days something's gonna get me. Yeah, and but I live in the best of all of that because if I were to live in Sedona, for one, it's way too hot there. Because they're further south, down, it's further, it's at lower elevation. I'm eight thousand feet, so it's I, it's perfect here. But this area I call the Sedona, Flagstaff, uh, Red Mesa area. And that's another one. And it's, I cannot decide what I like the best. Bonnersphere, Idaho was beautiful. Southern Idaho around Arco and Pocatello, Pocatello, you know. Oh, my uncle used to say that. We used to live near there. Soda Springs and, uh, you know, Blackfoot and, uh, I don't know. A lot of people may have driven through there and thought, well, it's desolate. Oh, man, the Sawtooth Mountains aren't far. It's, oh, McCall. Eh, some of the cities up in the mountains there. But down, kind of as you're getting down into the valleys, this big Arco area where it's all Blackfoot, it's all lava. It's kind of like an area there in New Mexico that I love very much. That's another spot. But anywhere you go, and I haven't been... I've driven through, you know, like Chicago and stuff, but beyond, up inside the the gloves up in Michigan and Wisconsin. I haven't actually wa wandered around up in there and camped. But I've seen pictures and a friend of mine lives there and I, 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 I've seen some videos of it and stuff and he's told me about it. It's, I know it's just as pretty there as anywhere. I mean, the, the ocean, the reefs and the things that you see in these different, different places. <sighs> California. I was born in Fresno up in the mountains at the base of Mount Whitney. Yosemite, that is the most beautiful place in the world. There's the Redwoods. Washington's got Mount Olympus and the Olympus Park, which is Olympia Park, is the most beautiful place in all the world. If you got to go see the Redwoods and the Olympias, and I mean, it's like I don't think I could say what is the prettiest. It's all equally. I I I I don't think I'd ever want to live in one place and never go anywhere. Now I, I haven't been able to travel much since I've been here, and I've got a lot of things I want to see before I go traveling too far. But but if 
we're not in the tribulation by next summer, which I think we're going to be getting close. But if there's still a little bit of time, we can take a little trip, get in one more little bit, you know, camping trip. I'm going to be going and visiting and taking you guys with me to a lot of these beautiful places around here. And by the way, these beautiful yellow flowers have now turned into white flowers. And different ones have different shapes, but ah, it's just unbelievable. Unbelievable. Oh yeah, I don't say that word anymore, sorry. I used to, I got that into my head though, because I used to say that, unbelievable. Or a hilarious, that's just hilarious. Uh. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know where I would say. I would say that this is my favorite place. One of my favorite places is the Ozarks. Uh, up around the Illinois River. That, if you've ever been to the Illinois River, they have these canoes that you can rent and go down for several mile area there. There's some nice restaurants and there's, there's uh, some places to stay overnight. A lot of people go there. It's a beautiful, beautiful river. There's lots of beautiful canyons. I've seen some beautiful things in Arkansas. And over into the yeah east side of Oklahoma, up and through Missouri. My stepdad lived used to live up there. Quite beautiful. I've driven up through North Dakota all the way to the Canadian border. I've seen a lot of things, and I can't tell you what is the most beautiful. I've been up through New York. And uh, I believe this is the safest place for me now. And it's the most beautiful because it's kind of where I need to be right now. The memories here would last me of an eternity. With my daughter now being closer here because she's in California. Before I wanted to be out by, by her in Tennessee. But now she's moved and she's an architect now, by the way, guys. I told her I didn't want her to you know, get involved in being a lawyer or doctor or anything like that. So she didn't know she was taking philosophy. Well, she's decided to go into architecture school. And yeah, she's doing really good, too. And that looked like a some kind of a weird... Where is it? For some reason, it won't... I can't... There it is. Looks like a dinosaur or something. For some reason though it here. Oh, it's that light that's in the way. It's focusing on that beam of light. Yeah, I gotta block the beam of light. Looks like a little dinosaur. But I can cannot tell you anywhere. There's nowhere I could have bought property for a hundred bucks a month like this anywhere. This is where the Lord wanted me. And this is probably makes me, my heart happier than any place I could be right now. It's just so beautiful for, for, for where I need to be and for what I'm, you know, I because I've, I've already spent some time in the Oklahoma and the Oak trees and uh, let's go this way And so I'm, I'm, it's been a while since I've been in the desert areas. And my dream is for a long time is to have land like this in a deserted area where I've got caves and rocks and things. This is kind of where I'm at right now in my heart. But I was telling the Lord after the tribulation's over and 
it's time to restore this old world back to paradise. I will um, love to see some more of that Ozark area in the Alabama, Tennessee, Georgia area. But I also want to go back to where I was born, to Fresno. Boy, it gets hot there down in the valley. Just scorches and it's just yellow. The grass is, turns as yellow as yellow can be. It's beautiful orange yellow. But, and that's not the best part because I wouldn't probably live down there. But you go up into the foothills from Fresno, you're going up into Yosemite and, and uh, Sequoia National Park. And, and up, there was a little place where I lived. And it wasn't actually in, I was born in a hospital in Fresno, I guess. But we lived up near a little place called Shaver's Lake. I guess somewhere because that's all I know because I was a baby but just because my brother used to talk about Shaver's Lake and I, I used to I heard him say something about we were near a place called Auberry. I think I drove through there once but I, I, I don't know I was a baby when we were there but I got pictures you know pictures and uh, dad was a trapper <laughs> That's what he did for a living when I was born. We lived there. And it's beautiful. Yosemite National Park. And the sequoia trees and stuff. But I, I want to see it now as an adult. So I'd like to spend some time there. I spent time around off. Ooh. Lizard or a snake? What was that? I don't know if I caught that on the camera, but something slid right by my foot. Went into that hole. Oh, goes far, way back in there. No, that's dangerous. Come back. Come on, honey. Come this way. That's too dangerous. You fall off there. You silly dog. Let me get these dogs out of here. Oh, they can't get up that way. You have to go around, honey. There you go. There you are. Come around, baby. This way. Don't go that way. Come on. Come on, babe. You may come get you. There you is. Silly. I love that little doggy.
That's the little one. He's getting bigger. He's the cutest thing I ever saw. What's that in that hole? A noopy noopy? Alright. Look at that. Ooh coffee holder right there. You sit here and put your coffee on there. These dogs. These are climbers. You got a bunch of climbers. Mountain dogs. Cliff dwellers. You know the gear cliff dwelling is one of the first look at these round things. Those are like fossils. I believe or something. But yeah, we're gonna go look at the cliff dwellings probably the first thing in the spring. I don't know. Or maybe earlier. But I got a few things to do I wanna catch up on do here before I take off and start traveling a little bit. But I mean the gear cliff dwellings is just Oh, 40, 50 miles or something. I don't know. It's just down. I, I'm in the thick of all this beautiful area. And it's it's kind of like um, the Arizona Mesa Verde. But it's better because there's nobody there. You don't have this big park where everybody's, you know, you pay before you go in. And I don't know if you pay before you go in there or not, but... I don't think so. I think you might have to leave five dollars in the box or something. I don't know to park there. I'm not sure, but they don't have a oh a ranger station. There's nobody stationed there. I think people they come around once in a while in the car and look around. And, but you're not being supervised when you go and you look through there, which is something that I kind of like because there's not too many people. Well, wow. This to me is like, no matter what time of year you, and I've seen this is kind of in the case no matter where I've ever been. But you think it's spring, it's the prettiest, and then summer comes, there's more flowers and greener. and Then you think it's fall with all the fall colors. And then when fall starts going away and this is getting into the winter, they get into these weird pastels and stuff. It's almost just as pretty. And then of course you get a blanket of white for a few days. Or a couple, three weeks or more. Some, some areas of course you get a lot more than that, but oh man. Ooh. Look at the color. Huh?
all those yellow flowers are now white. Kind of, or, well, they're kind of this color, but I don't know what color that is, peachy color. And that lasts for a month or so, the color. I don't know, a couple months more. I even like it. I used to think those look like weeds, things like that. I like the look of all this kind of stuff. My mother used to go collect flowers like this. I'm like, Mom, those are weeds. Yeah, but she thought they were pretty. She put them in like dried flower arrangements. I think they're more pretty than regular flowers you buy at the store. The natural look is just the most beautiful. I did not harvest the pine nuts, the pinions. I just got busy and didn't even go look. Wow. I don't know, but that just delights my soul to see these beautiful flowers. Even this little, these flowers here. A little dried arrangement. Contrasts, that's what it's all about. Colors and contrasts, shadows and depths. Which I guess helps us to feel the song. It's like beautiful music. What's the difference between music that is melodious and music, music that Sounds like somebody's getting ready to die. You know, I like the melodious. Ah, home sweet home. I love sitting here on under this big old pine tree. Ah, you're a squirrel. Did you find a squirrel? Alright guys, I'm going to go. Have a great and wonderful day.